Um, hi everyone, good morning and welcome to our second webinar um, on the Understanding Tax for Business. Uh, my name is Wendy from Sandbox International and we are your host today for the webinar. For those who joined us last week and you're returning, thank you so much for coming back. We have such a packed webinar today for the next two hours um, and I hope Please remember to ask questions in the chat. If you have any inquiries, please do ask them in the chat with regards to whatever will be discussed in the webinar. Um, utilize the chat function. Um, my name is Wendy, as I had mentioned, from the Sandbox, and I'll just talk a bit about the Sandbox before I hand over to our very able moderator. Um, at the Sandbox, we are a host to 33, 35 businesses offering professional support um, to entrepreneurs to allow them to scale their businesses and grow profitable businesses. And this is achieved through professionals like Thomas, who's on the call today, um, who is a financing and accounting expert here at the Sandbox. That is just one of the services we offer here at Sandbox, including marketing, HR, PR, events, and so many more. We are located at CMS Africa House along Chania Avenue. Um, on the ground floor, or you can send us an email at caribou at sandboxgroup.com um, and we'll be happy to support you through your entrepreneurship journey. Once again, please make sure you ask all the questions possible on eTeams, as you have seen on the screen already. Today's topic is all about eTeams, and this is your time to ask, this is your time to learn, this is your time to seek all the clarity that you might be looking for in regard to eTeams. Um, yes, so I want to hand over to Faustina, who will be our moderator for the for the session. Um, over to you, Faustina. Thank you, Wendy, and good morning to everybody that has tuned in for this hot conversation, this hot topic that um, is seems to be a, a thorny area when it comes to entrepreneurs. So, um, as Wendy has said, this is actually part of a series of webinars that we are hoping to host, whereby we enable entrepreneurs to be able to do good business, hence the title, Good Business Practices um, for Entrepreneurs. So our core focus is on the core of what you have as a business, which is how do we empower you to be able to run your business without having to think about matters compliance, matters the tax man, that you know, just seem to be interfering with your ability to run a full business. And to do that, the best way um, that Sandbox um, felt like it should add value to you as an entrepreneur is to bring the key people who are involved in um, enabling you to remain compliant when it comes to tax matters. And as such, they have set up for us an interesting blend of experts, that is the E-Teams experts from the Kenya Revenue Authority, we have Susan Jerry, who's also a tax expert from the Kenya Revenue Authority, and um, Thomas Warira, an expert from the Sandbox community, is a finance expert. But I will do, I will tell you more about the, the actual panel. But this is just to get your mindset towards what we're about to discuss today. So please, um, from wherever you're coming in, um, relax. You can even tell us in the chat box where you're coming in so that you see how far we are reaching. Um, we're reaching the communities and it will also inform KRA and how best to um, position themselves when it comes to um, sharing information. So with that, I will dive into the introduction of our very able panel and I'll even ask them to kindly turn on their videos. I cannot see Thomas, I cannot see Susan, or now I can see Thomas. Um, at least I can, I can see Martin, okay? So I think that's good. Susan, you wanna see your lovely face? Please show yourself. They don't tell us that we are, uh, we decided to just bring in a human who does not have a face and we are claiming they are from Kiari. <laughs> okay, so I'll just get into the introductions and I will start with home. Okay, home is me, myself. My name is Faustina Nina and I am your moderator for the day. I work for an organization that is called Wild International. Wild International, we are very passionate about SMEs. We are passionate about entrepreneurship. Why are we passionate about them? It is because we have the tools and the resources that will enable them to be able to find clarity in what they do, be able to think strategically so that they can succeed. 
those entrepreneurs that have had the privilege to work with Wild can confirm that at least 30% of where we got, um, we have managed to contribute at least 30% of their growth, um, growth in various terms. It could be financial, it could be uh, markets and so on and so forth. So that is the kind of value that we bring. 30% is the minimum. We can even get you to 100%. We can even get you to 10 times the value that you're at as an organization. We have done this for the past 20 years, very, very passionately, very, very intentionally. And so we welcome you to join Wild International for your strategic needs, for your training needs, and so on and so forth. And as Wendy has mentioned, we are housed by our very honorable mother, that is the Sandbox. Um, so once you walk into the Sandbox, just know that part of the experts that you will find is Wild International. And then I'm not gonna move too far from where I am. I'm also joined by another um, expert at the Sandbox, that is Thomas Barira, our finance and accounting expert. He is the co-founder and the director of a company called Probity Consult. He's an accountant and a financial management, um, running a financial management firm that provides services to SMEs, nonprofits for the last 11 years. So we're bringing you people who know their stuff, right? Um, so, and in terms of what he does within the finance and accounting area, he has done this for the last 25 years, gaining corporate accolades, um, respected by multiple consultants, and he is also a consultant himself. He has top skills in accounting, management, reporting, tax, and tax compliance, worked with over 70 SMEs and nonprofits, guiding them in setting up their processes, accounting processes, setting up their tax compliance structures, automating their financial processes, and helping them maintain records, because records will still feature in today's, uh, in today's um, part two. And um, Thomas has guided me as a ministry upskilling, me included, um, so that we are able to generate timely information, accurate information, and be in a position to make informed decisions. So that is Thomas, and I'm sure when I give him the first opportunity to speak, he'll still say more about himself. Um, so I'll just quickly move to the next panelist, and this is basically the authorities in the room. And um, we will start with Susan Jeru, who um, hosted us in the last panel discussion that we had, that was two weeks ago. Um, Susan is an assistant manager for stakeholder engagement and complaints management at the Kenya Revenue Authority, overseeing initiatives to enhance taxpayer education and streamline complaints resolutions. Susan has 16 years of experience in tax administration, gained in various roles within the Kenya Revenue Authority, including VAT refunds, compliance, tax-based expansion, expansion term. So she has worked with numerous MSMEs and SMEs, I'm sure even multinationals and other stakeholders, getting them matters tax compliance. So when you have an issue, what Susan is saying is, I am your go-to person. There is no department at KRA that I do not know. Yeah, she is the working, um, she is the working guidebook within KRA, able to handle all the issues that you have. And lastly, we have um, brought in a new person, and um, this is by virtue of the demands and the requests that you got from uh, the last webinar that we had. So we have Martin Mokobi Osoro from the Kenya Revenue Authority. Martin Osoro is a seasoned officer within the teams uh, slash e-teams operations unit of the Kenya Revenue Authority, bringing a wealth of expertise in tax administration. He holds a, a degree in business um, from Strathmore University and has an MBA from USIU, our very own USIU. Um, Martin navigates the complexities of revenue administration with finesse. Today we are going to test that word finesse um, from him. Off duty, what does he like to do? Because he's not just a tax man, right? Um, off duty, guess what? He's a footballer and unfortunately, unfortunately, he supports of all teams, Manchester United. Me and him are just not each other's friends. Um, and he likes to indulge in TV viewing. Uh, Matt, Martin's blend of professional prowess and personal passion make him capt a captivating speaker, although I wouldn't say that about the team, offering insights into both the intricate realm of taxation and the lighter side of life. So, Moana Manchester, Karibu Sana to this webinar. 
Karibu sana to this webinar. Um, and I know it's going to be one of those exciting conversations because I can actually even see the number of people streaming in. So, so many people have joined in to listen to the three of you. So welcome to my panel. Um, and um, with that introduction in terms of um, the team on board, I will dive into it. And this time around, as we dive, before we dive into the question and answer or the conversation um, that we are about to have, we're going to start with a presentation. So we, will, we want to give the KRE team an opportunity to at least show us what this eatings is all about. Then based on what they're going to present, we can proceed to having our um, pumped up conversation. So tune in, today is our day to demystify eatings. All right, so Martin, over to you. Thank you very much, Faustina. Uh, it's unfortunate we are starting off on the wrong foot and uh, that uh, you support another team, but not uh, Manchester United. But I'm sure by the end of this, we'll have found a common ground somewhere. So welcome, everybody. As you've heard, my name is Martin Kobiosoro. I do work in the teams, E-Teams Operations Unit of the Kenya Revenue Authority. And I think without much further ado, we'll just proceed with the presentation. So I'm sure many of us have heard about items. It's something that uh, as business people, as uh, people in that SME space and MSMEs, uh, it's something that we're finding more and more we have to comply with. So when we talk about items, what exactly are we referring to? So we are talking about a software system that allows for electronic invoicing. So if I can just take our minds back, I think uh, particularly during the uh, Kibaki regime, we had our first uh, instances of ETR machines, or I think what most of us refer to as the PSD machines, which allowed us to do our invoicing. And then in 2020, thereabouts, we migrated to the new regime of what we call the ETR devices or the Teams machines. And in this case, Teams just stands for Tax Invoice Management System. So this was an electronic tax register that not only allowed us to do our invoicing, but it also allowed for transmission of the same to the authority as they came with an internet enabled functionality. So as soon as we do the invoice, we transmit it to the authority. And ETIMS is simply, again, a continuation of that regime. ETIMS allows us to be able to install and configure any of our existing machines and to turn them into an ETR. So we're able to configure our laptops, our phones, our PDQs, or any other uh, computing device that we may have. And um, as you can see, we've enumerated a few of uh, the benefits that are derived. The biggest one is that for the people in the SME, MSME space, it is a free solution. So most of us already have our laptops because maybe we use Excel to do our some small business analysis here and there and to generate this and that report. So we are able to install items free of charge on that machine or on your phone or on your tablet or any other machine that you may provide us with. So you incur no extra cost in terms of becoming compliant. It also simplifies uh, tax return filing. Yeah, I think we, particularly for the VAT registered taxpayers, we have become familiar and conversant with the issue of the auto-populated returns. And uh, as we continue with the implementation of ETIMS, I think we'll be seeing more of our transactions being captured in the return already. And all we'll have to do is to confirm the details of those transactions. 
thus simplifying that whole return filing process that uh, bothers so many people. It's flexible, as we've said, we are able to install it on a number of machines. Uh, depending on which computing machine you have, we don't discriminate, we are able to install it on any of them. Business growth and record keeping, you know, by virtue of being able to keep records, you're able to keep track of your expenses, you're able to keep track of your revenue. The system allows us to do that and it makes it easier. Even when you walk into a bank for a loan, you're able to show them some trends that you have been experiencing in your business, makes it much easier to receive financing, for example. So the system acts like a, an ERP that allows us to have a view of uh, the whole organization from one point, and this again just helps uh, our taxpayers to be able to plan better and uh, for their business to record some growth. So, why uh, are we as an authority emphasizing on electronic tax invoicing? Uh, we have benchmarked with a number of other tax jurisdictions. We have uh, seen what other uh, jurisdictions are doing. And, and just to align with best practice, we have also adopted uh, this uh, issue of electronic tax invoicing. It also enhances transparency, it enhances efficiency. We are able to see from our end what exactly is being transacted or the details of the transactions. So we are able to give uh, accurate tax assessments to taxpayers and the process is simplified. You know, we don't have to now be coming to your premises all the time, demanding this, demanding that. The process now becomes efficient. We have details of your transactions. So even the interface between KRA and the taxpayers becomes much easier and uh, we even become best friends actually. Uh, it also enhances compliance because if more people are declaring uh, the transactions that they are doing and we are able to see the details of these transactions, we are all paying uh, what you're supposed to be paying, compliance rates rise. And of course, the biggest uh, reason for why we are emphasizing ETIMS is increased tax revenue. We're able to expand the tax base so that we did not know our transacting before. We are now able to see the details of their transactions and uh, we're able to increase our tax revenue. So uh, as with everything Care does, there's a legal basis for everything that we do. And even ETIMS is supported by a number of statutes. The biggest ones are the ones listed on the on the screen. Income Tax Act, the TPA, but or the Tax Procedures Act. We also have the Value Added Tax Act, as well as the recently published uh, Electronic Tax Invoice Regulations of 2024. So these frameworks tell us how exactly uh, ETIMS is going to be applied who is supposed to use it, for what purpose, and it also goes out and or goes further and spells out the details of the penalties for not using items. So these are statutes that in our own time you can just acclimatize with so that uh, when Kare visits you, you do not say you are found off guard. Who exactly should adopt ETIMS? So the picture I think we are seeing on the screen is very poignant. It's a, uh, I think it's very important that uh, we take a deep look at what we are seeing. And the reason we chose these pictures is just to emphasize that everybody in business whether you have VAT or you don't, or you're registered for TOT or whatever obligation, it does not matter. 
all persons or entities in business are required to adopt ETIPS and uh, to use the same for invoicing. So next, I'd like us to now take a look at um, some of the solutions that uh, are being offered by Kiare when we talk about ETIMS. We do have four modules. And uh, the first one is what we refer to as the ETIMS Lite. So this is an ETIMS software solution that is being offered in conjunction with eCitizen. And uh, we are relying on the eCitizen platform to offer this particular solution. So under the items light, we do have three sub modules. We have the first one, uh, which is the USSD, where we dial that USSD code, start triple two hash. And uh, this one is for B2C. So for our SMEs, you have a working customer who, you know, whatever they are buying, they're going to go consume maybe in their homes or in their offices. Maybe they don't want to claim anything uh, from that particular transaction. The USSD code is the perfect solution to cover such transactions. The web and the mobile app, these are mostly for the B2B. Uh, transactions. So here, if you're selling to an institutional buyer or you're selling to a buyer who intends to claim that as an expense in their income tax return, those two are the solutions that we use. So it's important to note that for the items light options, the three sub-modules we've mentioned, you can use them concurrently. You don't have to be just on USSD and not on web. You are able to use them all at the same time to generate your invoices and the invoices will still uh, count, you know, uh, sequentially. So even if I do my invoice number one with the USSD, I can still do my invoice number two using the web and my invoice number three using the mobile app. So items light is uh, geared for non-VAT taxpayers. And if you have a VAT obligation on your PIN, you are not able to use items light. So secondly, we can, we can now look at what you call items client. So items client, as you can see, it's suited for traders selling goods. So here, this is for those of us who have stock. We deal uh, in stock. And uh, ETIMS client is installed. Any of the computing machines that you may have, it's an app that is installed. And uh, for this one, both non-VAT and VAT taxpayers can onboard. We also have the ETIMS online portal. So this is suited and it's uh, uniquely for those traders who supply services. So here we are talking about our lawyers, we are talking about our accountants, we are talking about our friends here in Sandbox. This is for players in the service industry. And again, both our VAT and non-VAT taxpayers can on board. Lastly, we have what we refer to as the system to system integration. So this is usually for the uh, larger sized companies those ones who are already using ERPs, uh, and ERPs just referred to as enterprise resource planning systems. And they have configured these systems to, to meet their business needs. So the, uh, the business systems offer them a lot of value, and they may not want to let go of that system in order to onboard onto the other ETIM solutions. So there's an option for us to be able to integrate directly into this ERP system of theirs and extract the information that is deemed necessary for taxation. So these are the four modules that we have when we talk about items, and all of us fall under this uh, spectrum. 
So it's important that uh, we also mention the process of onboarding uh, onto eTeams. So the first step is to sign up on uh, what we refer to as the taxpayer portal or the eTeams portal. And uh, once you've signed up here, it's pretty much just creating an account so that we know it is so and so who's doing this request and uh, they're doing a request for this and this solution. So once you've signed up, you are able to do, as I've said, that service request. There's a tab for it in your profile and uh, you'll be required to upload uh, the ID uh, of the owner of the business or the director. And after you've uploaded, you do send the request, which will be considered and uh, approved on merit. If all the details match, it will be approved. If not, you will get a reason for why the request is being rejected. After approval, we're also able to do what we refer to as software configuration, which is if you're onboarding the eTeam solution, we actually install that on your machine. And uh, after which you're now able to proceed with the process of invoice generation and transmission. It's important for me to also mention we support this whole process. You're able to walk into any care office uh, wherever you are in the country, we have a number of eTeams champions in the different offices and they can provide you with whatever support you need on any part of this sign up process. We're also going to look at how we onboard uh, the eTeams Lite or the eCitizen options. So it's imperative to note that for us to be able to use these solutions, we'll be required to have an e-citizen profile. So if you don't have one, you'll be required to create one. And uh, once you've created one, again, you'll now be required to sign in, after which uh, on, sign, on signing in, there's only, it's a two, I think it's called two-factor authentication where you are also going to receive a one-time password either to your mobile number or to your email address. So once you have inputted that whole process, you will now be able to be redirected to the KRA platform on the eCitizen uh, website, after which you can now proceed with uh, invoicing. So for our USSD option, here we don't really require to connect to the internet. Here we are dialing a USSD code. So we always need to remember that for this option, you always have to have at least one book as credit on your mobile phone. So there's a small credit charge of one shilling. And uh, once you have that one book on your phone, you simply dial the USSD code. We select option five for carry and other carry services that are offered, uh, under which we will now select option two, which is the items invoice. So the first time we dial the USSD code, we'll be required to sign up. Hence why you can see step four and step five is asking you to enter your details, year of birth and the ID number and uh, step six asks you to confirm. So this particular option is linked as well to the national registry. And once you enter this information, you'll be able to see your name. Ideally, it will populate your name as uh, you had registered it at the registry. So uh, after you finish your registration, whenever you want to generate an invoice, you will simply be dialing the USSD code, same path up to step three, only that now step four will become different and it will require you to now be indicating and inputting the details of your transaction. So that is the sign up process. So our items uh, solutions are unique in such a way that there are those ones that 
allow us to keep a record of the stock and others that do not. So when we look at uh, uh, the item system, an important question that we need to ask ourselves is who may use a system that does not record stock? Uh, the first one is a person who is providing simply services. Here we talked about the service uh, sector players, uh, people like lawyers, people like uh, accountants and consultants and others. So for them, really, they do not have any stock that they sell. So they are not going to be required to use a system that records stock. The second one is any person who's using our e-citizen options. Again, uh, that option just allows us to do the invoice, but it does not require us to manage and to record our stock within the system. The third, uh, the third type of taxpayer who's not going to be required to use a system that has the stock management module is any person using a system prescribed by the commission. Here we are talking about those taxpayers who already have ETR machines. But it's important that I mention, even though we will not be required to keep a record of our stock within the system, we'll still have to have a record of them even if it's in a file in our offices or somewhere. And uh, that is a requirement by law, as you can see uh, in the TPA uh, Act. There's a requirement that we are able to keep a record of our stock up to five years. So that is always an important point to note. So when we talk about items, um, we have a number of transactions. I want to insist on the transactions bit because we often confuse transactions to mean that there are sectors that are exempted. No, there are no sector-wide exemptions. We have specific transactions that are exempted from the provisions of items because of the nature of those transactions. So, so the first exemption is emoluments subject to pay uh, for the salaried folks. Whenever you are being paid your salary by your employer, you are not required to issue your employer with an invoice for your salary that month. This is because, again, the nature of that transaction, you are permanently employed there. And, and uh, Pay again is uh, accounted for using a different system. Our employers account for the pay and they remit that pay by the ninth of every month. So that one is viewed in another system. Importation of goods and services. For those of us who import uh, our stock from other jurisdictions like China, we will not expect that uh, they issue us with an ETIMS invoice for us to pay them. You wouldn't expect that Chinese trader in Beijing to issue you with an invoice. So again, the nature of that transaction means that there is no invoice, ETIMS invoice that is required. And in the case of importation of goods, we account for that uh, in the ICMS system, the Integrated Customs Management System. So that transaction is declared via that system. We also have what we refer to as the airline passenger ticketing. Here, this is the process that, uh, this is a very tricky transaction because uh, there's something for us to understand. When a ticket is being generated, the tickets are generated by a global body known as IATA. And again, this transaction between IATA and the airlines is governed uh, by other rules. And it is accounted for 
differently than uh, other the airlines other transactions but in the case where maybe you're using a travel agent to generate this ticketing for you the travel agent will be required to invoice you for any service fee that they are charging you on top of the air the ticket amount so they will not be required to invoice for the ticket so if the ticket is being offered to them at 90,000 by the airline that is different but if they charge you let's say a service fee of 5,000 shillings on top this is now what is going to be income for the travel agent so that 5,000 shillings is what they will invoice you for not the 95,000 uh which is the ticket amount plus the service fee this is usually a very confusing uh, transaction but uh, i hope i've done my best to explain it and that you've understood it we also have investment allowances including internal accounting adjustments so investment allowances are whenever we do huge investments or capital projects the law allows us to amortize that amount over a period of time claim back that amount of a period of time and the time frame is usually specified in law so for us to be able to claim those allowances in our returns it is not required that there will be invoices to support this uh, claiming of the allowances in the return because these are just adjustments that we do to our uh, tax returns so we also have fees charged and uh, levied by financial institutions so here we have things like uh, dividends and uh, royalties for example they're covered under this even when we are earning or these dividends are being paid out again we are not going at, that as shareholders we now issue an invoice to the company to pay us our dividends isn't it so again that is another transaction that is exempted from the provisions of items we also have uh, interest income you know financial institutions sometimes they give us loans or we're able to get loans from them and they levy an interest charge uh, on the loan this interest is income for the financial institution but once you have agreed on the repayment plan with the bank it is not again for them to be issuing you with a invoice every month to tell you that this is the interest income you need to be paying to us every month so again because of the nature of that transaction it is exempted from the provisions of items we have services provided by an unresident without a permanent establishment i hope we are all uh, cognizant with the issue of residency uh, when it comes to matters of taxation who's a resident and who is an unresident so just for illustration purposes i think all of us in this meeting are residents uh, and our companies and our businesses are resident businesses but we have cases where there are non-resident companies like uh, YouTube who operate in Kenya, but they have no permanent establishment. In this case, just to mean they have no physical address here in Kenya where we can find them. But they are still operating. I, I'm sure we all watch YouTube on our, on our gadgets. We watch YouTube at home and uh, we usually see even the advertisements that come up uh, on youtube so for you to have an advertisement on the youtube platform you have to pay them okay uh, for them to be able to put that advertisement so you have a case where uh, an unresident company is operating in kenya it's deriving an income but they do not have a permanent establishment. So this transaction, I think usually they give you a way of payment, uh, usually bank transfer. So this is another transaction that does not need to be supported by an ITIMS invoice. This is because 
non-resident company pay a tax we call digital services tax and this tax is usually 1.5 percent if i'm not wrong of the gross amount that they earn here in this jurisdiction so by virtue of paying dst we are able to see the details of that transaction and it's accounted for elsewhere so there is no requirement for an items invoice to support this transaction lastly we also have expenses subject to withholding tax as a final tax here again is when we are dealing with uh, an example would be you bring in a consultant from um, outside kenya and with this consultancy service that you're offering them they are a resident in another jurisdiction so for them they will have to account for their income let's say the uh, consultant is from South Africa. They have no obligation to account for their income here, but they will account for their income in South Africa. That's why they pay income tax. But when we are paying them, uh, the amount, maybe they've told us they, are, uh, they charge $1,000 for this consultancy, we will be required to withhold a percentage I think we're all, uh, again, aware of withholding taxes. So we will have to withhold a percentage of this $1,000. So they will take the balance, the 800, that is what they will go and account for. And then this $200, uh, or if you withhold, we've withheld 20%, or is it 25% of what we are paying them, and we remit it to KRA, that is the end of the transaction so again because of the nature of that kind of a transaction you are dealing with an unresident who has no obligation uh, as to income tax in our jurisdiction that withholding tax becomes a final tax so that is the only tax they will pay the rest they will pay in south africa so because of the nature of that transaction uh, this transaction is exempted from having to pass through items. This is not to say that further transactions cannot be exempted, but uh, for the uh, exemption to be considered, it has to be done through a written application to the commissioner. And there are three conditionalities. First is that uh, the transaction information information uh, relevant to taxation in that transaction is already being received through a platform recommended by the commission uh, or uh, the information is being transmitted to the authority uh, upon recommendation by the relevant authority where this uh, taxpayer is operating in you know maybe operating in a sector that is unique in its own way so when the relevant authority that governs that sector inform us in writing that might be again another basis for an exemption and the third uh, the third condition is that the person's transaction information may not be under the mandate of any other ministry or regulatory body so those are the three conditions for exemptions uh, from items. So next, we have um, what we want to refer to as some work in progress solutions. And um, in our journey to try and make our taxpayers to be compliant, we are engaging with uh, bodies that operate in uh, certain sectors let's call them business member organizations you know and um, one of the sectors where we've had a lot of feedback and a lot of engagement is the agricultural sector so here we've been told that uh, maybe sometimes farmers may not have the knowledge of being able to use some of our solutions 
So what we did is that we sat down with these member organizations and uh, we asked them, okay, because you guys already have farmers, you're already operating in a certain way, explain to us how that process looks like. So from what we got, and I'll give the example maybe of the sugar sector, is that um, the sugar millers usually have a repository of their farmers, right? They contract farmers, and once the farmer is contracted, they will now be required to supply sugarcane to the miller. So once the sugarcane reaches the miller's premises and it has been received, the first thing that they do is they grade. They see what they can use uh, for the purposes of uh, manufacturing sugar and what they cannot. And after they have done the grading, what is deemed to be okay for use, they will pay the farmer based on that, isn't it? So if let's say the agreed amount is a thousand shillings per ton and the farmer had brought a uh, hundred uh, kilos of a hundred kilos of or a thousand kilos of the sugar cane and then a hundred kilos is deemed to be poor quality, they will be paid for the 900 uh, kilos of what they have supplied. So when it came to the part about invoicing, because the farmer, the farmer has supplied and the miller has done the grading, the miller is now the one who will generate the invoice and the farmer will now be required to come maybe after three, four days or however long to the miller's premises to collect the invoice plus the check, for example. So based on this particular model of invoicing, we decided that for the agricultural sector, this is what we are going to adopt. And that is why you're seeing two solutions written there, reverse invoicing and buy initiated invoicing. So these two work in progress solutions work in the same manner that I've just described. It is the buyer who will generate the invoice on behalf of the seller. In this case, it is going to be the sugar miller who will generate the invoice on behalf of the farmer. The unique thing about this uh, from what has been happening is that even though the buyer is generating the invoice on behalf of the seller, the sugar miller doing it on behalf of the farmer, the farmer will still have to give consent before the invoice is raised. So as soon as the buyer generates the or begins the process to generate the invoice, before it becomes an official and validated invoice, the farmer has to say yes or no. And they will do this by receiving a message on their phone. So if they say no, the invoice will not proceed. But if they say yes, the invoice will become official. So for the two solutions, the unique thing or the difference between reverse invoicing and by initiated invoicing is the platform uh, through which the invoicing will be done. So for the reverse invoicing, here the buyers already have an ERP, okay? They already have an existing system that they use. So once they have the repository of the farmers, we will simply do that system to system integration to their system. Buyer initiated invoicing, we are the ones as carrier to provide the platform that uh, will now be used. So here the platform will be offered uh, in conjunction with eCitizen and all the buyers will have to on board onto eCitizen, generate a list of their customers or generate a list of their suppliers, sorry, and they will now use the eCitizen platform to do the invoicing. 
So the only difference between reverse invoicing and buy initiated invoicing is the platform on through which it is going to be done uh, and hosted on. To learn more about eTeams, we uh, are able to go to our website, kare.geo.ke. We have uh, a lot of information uh, about eTeams. Uh, we are able to even have a section for frequently asked questions. And uh, we can just familiarize ourselves with those questions. Sometimes maybe, you know, outside of this kind of an engagement, you might think of another question. We've tried to be as detailed and as uh, we've answered as many questions as possible. So we're able to uh, see them on the website. We're also able, maybe if I was speeding through this presentation, we're still able to go through who should be using eTeams, you know, which solution is for who, how do I onboard onto this platform or that platform? So you are able to see that all on the website. And even the software that we install on uh, the taxpayer's machine, the eTeams client, the software is available on the website. Uh, to reach us, these are our extensions. Uh, I'll leave this page up for a while. Uh, you're also able to uh, email us. You can see our email address listed there, team support at kre.ke. Or you can visit us uh, physically. We are located on uh, eighth floor of uh, Jaquat Towers, which is along Kenyatta Avenue. And as I finish, uh, my extension is among uh, those ones listed there. So I will just, uh, I'll just leave it uh, mysteriously like that. Uh, maybe one day someone can call and uh, you might find me. <laughs> so I think we've now come to the end of the presentation. And uh, probably maybe now we can, I think, uh, proceed to the Q&A. Faustina. I'll just hand it back to you for you to guide us on how we proceed. Good morning once again, everybody. Um, thank you so much for that, Matthew. I'm saying good morning once again. I see you talking a lot of people. What's been with you? Thank you so much for that elaborate uh, explanation that entrepreneurs have been judged for in terms of compliance. So Matic has basically demystified for us what this is all about. And what he has talked about is um, who is expected to use this system, what system, depending on the kind of business we're running, body, what are the solutions that are being offered by it, and who is exempt, is eligible and how do you incorporate that into your business? So thank you so much, uh, Martin, for that. However, as is the reality with us as entrepreneurs, this is a lot of information, and therefore it will be a disaster if it don't make sense. You know, when I talk about making sense, now speaking our own what we understand. In terms of what Martin has talked about. So, for those who just tuned in, um, we have lined up uh, a series of uh, experts who are going to help us with this. I want to be well about this is what Martin has uh, talked about at a great length. And I will start with um, Thomas. Thomas is an expert, uh, he is a finance and accounting expert, right? So Thomas, Martin has talked about eating the good things in the world for you. To be honest, as a entrepreneur, that is not the case. Compliance is not the case. They're about to do the finance bill in a few hours. Okay. So where do I start as a entrepreneur to ensure that I am eating? Thank you, Faustina. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, thank you, Martin, for that very elaborate uh, presentation. 
Uh, I think um, with that, um, as a business person at uh, the low end of the tier, or like you're saying, uh, informal kind of sector and that, uh, everything boils down and adds up to record keeping. We must be able to trans, um, to follow our transactions. We must be able to account for the transactions that we are making and uh, how we are making them. And therefore, in whatever business that you're doing, um, you then need to be able to actually uh, capture these transactions. Now, the question is, how do you go about uh, remembering all the transactions you've done in a day? Uh, what trans how do I put this together? How do I remember them? Uh, with the solutions that have been provided, like the items light, uh, depending on the frequency of the transactions as they happen in a day, you could be able then to actually generate invoices as you go along and you do these transactions. <clears throat> However, you will find there is the kind of person who is running multiple transactions in a very short span of time. And their customer does actually not need to go and account for this cost. Therefore, they do not need the invoice. So for that, you should be able to actually tra track your transactions for a moment of time, an hour, two hours, and then generate an invoice uh, for those transactions. And because they don't have to be personalized to the buyers, you can actually then put them together and uh, um, amalgamate them and generate one invoice for the sales that you have done for the last hour or the last two hours, that kind of thing. But it is very important that uh, we now track what we are doing from a business perspective. However informal our business is, we must be able to track uh, what we are selling. Uh, the beauty about this Faustina is that a lot of the platforms we use for payment like M-Pesa is able to help you track uh, what your sales are. So you can actually be able to sit back half an hour later, an hour later, two hours later, and actually track the sales you have and then generate the invoice uh, using the USSD uh, from that. Thank you. Back to you, Faustina. Thank you so much, Tomar. Um, so you have mentioned uh, record keeping and you have an example of so entrepreneurs can leverage the contractor to be able to track what it is that they are doing. But um, the concern that we have is that we are not able to separate our personal financial and our business financial and this is just for most entrepreneurs. But so I would like to put a question to Susan and ask her, um, you know, I'm certain this is a lot of questions about Accepting my better, it's a personal thing. So, in terms of what Gary is trying to do, how you, how you think you need to feel the world in terms of human, to feel confident, to be able to use your better as a person, as a person, yes, or what else has you think of Gary? Thank you, Gary. Um, of Ostina, on the part of what what the taxpayer uh, is able to do with this is uh, one we always encourage a separation of business and personal and uh, as much as possible uh, it is very possible then to register for an informal business to register uh, two mpesa lines so as a business owner uh, you can actually register two mpesa lines and separate keep your personal transactions on one line and then keep your business transactions as much as possible on another line. Now that would be able to help you be able to separate it at a very uh, tertiary level. Um, on the other hand, uh, there's what we just call basic record keeping. So you can actually have a notebook um, and where you actually record these transactions as and when they happen, and then you can be able to consolidate them. So the element of being able to separate between personal and business has now become very critical because ideally whatever goes onto the eTeams platform should be your business related transactions, not your personal related transactions. So uh, basic would be register a separate M-Pesa line uh, as a sole trader in your name, but keep business transactions on one, keep personal transactions on the other, keep a notebook with you and record these things on the go as you go along or even just use your phone uh, to be able to record transactions uh, on the go as you have. Because many of us 
uh, as we do business, we have a gadget that we work with. We are paying our impressor from somewhere. So we probably have a phone that may help us do that. Over to you, Faustina. Thank you. Thank you so much so much for that. Um, for that, Thomas. I was actually changing my device because I've received feedback that I'm not audible enough. Um, but I hope right now guys can hear me. So please share your feedback if you cannot hear us. So thank you so much for that. Um, is Susan still with us or we can proceed? I can proceed to ask a question to Martin related to what he has actually talked about. So I think let me just proceed to you, Martin, and um, ask very specific questions. So one of the feedback that we have received from entrepreneurs, um, the, based on the questions that are streaming in, is that um, with eatings, we are unable to rectify on errors, right? So for instance, I have raised an invoice in May, and then I come to realize in June that there was an error with that particular invoice. What do I need to do so that I rectify it, especially when there's a VAT obligation to it? Thank you very much, Faustina. So when we talk about VAT, it's probably one of the most uh, problematic obligations for people. Uh, in terms of being able to make sure that they stay compliant uh, all through. So when we talk about VAT, um, there are things that we look at. So when you generate an invoice in the month of May, let's even say May 31st at 11.59 p.m., the uh, invoice is going to be deemed a May invoice. So you might be doing your reconciliation a few days later and uh, you discover sometime in June, even 3rd, 4th of June, that the 31st May invoice has an issue. So one thing that the system allows us to do is to generate what we call a credit note. And uh, a credit note usually allows us to correct uh, the error in the invoice. So on uh, ETIMS, uh, we are not able to do a partial credit note. On ETIMS, we do a full credit note, and then you will reissue the invoice again. So if you do the credit note, uh, let's say you have already uh, done the May return you filed, you can do a credit note even in June and you will adjust or you will amend the May uh, return uh, with the credit note that you have generated in June. So what we usually look at is the date of generation of the original invoice. If the invoice was generated in May, it does not matter for as long as we are, the law provides us with six months to be able to generate an, a credit note in order to rectify an invoice. So for as long as we are within that six month window or that six month period, we are still able to go back to the uh, period of uh, taxation that is in question and amend the return for that period. So back to you, Faustin. I hope that we have been able to answer that particular question. And uh, maybe as uh, Faustina logs back on. Sorry, sorry, I lost internet. I lost no, internet. No, it's okay. Yeah, I know, I know you are switching devices. But, um, yes. Maybe I can just attempt to capture uh, a few questions on the Q&A because I can uh, see just, some. Just before, just before that, because we've not really heard from Susan. I don't know if Susan is having some technical issues. I'm still here. I can't turn on my, my video, but I'm still here. Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Now, um, from what um, the example that uh, Martin was sharing, um, in as much as I had left, I missed out on like the last 10 sec seconds 
of what you what he was talking about um one of the things that we wanted to ask you is basically um helping us you know um get over the fear of reporting right so we feel like if we come to your office and we talk about what we are you know maybe it was it was actually a genuine error um sometimes we feel like by virtue of reporting this to you might end up unlocking a few more of pandora's box on the same kind of issue so how do you um basically as in what would be your word of advice to entrepreneurs so they don't fear saying what they don't know like the example that um you know the solution that martin has shared so how do you what, what should basically entrepreneurs do so they don't feel you know they don't get afraid to basically disclose when they make small errors and so on and so forth okay um i think the first advice i can give is for example to attend forums such as this um you notice that a lot of people actually um have, have asked so many questions and actually carry for example in this forum we don't have information on your pin and the nature of the transaction that you have undertaken so you can actually come and ask questions i think um i will not say it is it is um perhaps a fear that is is um is, is not i will not invalidate their concerns let me say that i will not validate or invalidate their concerns but come to forums like this and ask you can ask your question here also um you can walk into for example we have a, a taxpayer services office on ground floor times tower and if you walk in and you ask your query you can actually just walk in and ask you just let us know this is the transaction we actually have people who walk in every day even today which is part of the reason why i cannot turn on the camera is because we have so many taxpayers here and you have people who walk in they say I, I, this is what i want to import is it vertable this is how i want to sell it what are the tax implications so you can actually come into the taxpayer services office and we will be able to respond to those issues so i would say that um that even you can form a good relationship with your account manager. If you know your account manager, you can actually approach your account manager and inquire from them. But um, I, I would say attending forums such as this and even walking into the taxpayer services office, we will answer your queries. We will be able to respond to the questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, um, Susan. So basically, Susan has said, do not fear um do not fear walking into the carry offices or basically making the inquiry their job is not to stifle your business their job is to enable you to basically run your business so i have a question um that is directly um to thomas whose whose role is to help us to ensure that we are compliant and yes we as entrepreneurs we try our level best to be compliant we are business people we are not we are not in the business of paying tax. We do business so that taxes can be paid and we leave that to that. But Thomas, the thing is, when it comes to um, the compliance, we seem to be having a hard time because also remember we have internal systems. Yeah. And um, for instance, e -teams, it's, an in it's a tool that enables us to do invoicing. We already have our own invoicing tool. So how do we integrate what we have with what um, martin has shared has shared with us because he says it's it can link with any erp software that you're using as a business or quickbooks or whichever kind of system that you're using but it's it's not just as easy i'm sure you have experienced a lot of challenges um coming in from entrepreneurs so how do you help entrepreneurs to ensure that they can seamlessly integrate with items uh thank you Faustina. uh the requirement for items is basically an invoice which is usually in addition to the invoice that your system will generate so businesses are usually configured uh, to their systems uh, with smaller businesses we'll be looking at uh, zero quickbooks uh, so all those kind of systems um, so what happens is that the items now requirement is an invoice for the same transaction from a different system which is the item system so one depending on the volume of transactions that uh, a business is doing in a day uh, it may just be a little bit more administrative work to actually then raise the two invoices and ensure that uh, you match them uh, in your accounting system 
Uh, however, uh, when the volume of these uh, invoices is growing, there are options then to integrate uh, the eTeams solutions into your platform. And KRA has actually provided um, appointed vendors who can actually help you with such uh, integrations. Uh, and when such integrations are done, then all you need to do is keep raising your invoices on your system and automatically then uh, the invoices for eTeams are transmitted automatically, uh, issued and transmitted automatically. So there is a solution uh, as long as the accounting system that you're using uh, is able to integrate with other softwares, then it would be able to integrate with the eTeams uh, software. Your only challenge now would be if you're running an accounting software that cannot integrate to anything. And therefore, you may actually then need to run it and then run your eTeams invoices uh, on the site uh, or then upgrade the system to one then that can integrate uh, to eTeams. Oh, okay. All right, so we might need to, depending on how big your business is, maybe even hire an extra person to do that. But wait, some of us need to do that. Thomas. Yes, for the depending on how much uh, administrative work it is, you may need to do that. But again, the solution is integration, because uh, once you integrate uh, your system to eTeams then you just have the same person who's been raising invoices the same way they've been doing it. There'd be no additional work. However, if you are run a system that cannot integrate uh, to other systems uh, and your volume of invoices is high, uh, then from an administrative perspective, yes, you will need the additional hands to uh, cope with the work. Okay, all right. I think that is well understood that the solution is in the integration um but then again also there's there's another key concern that you seem to be getting in terms of differentiating what eatings is and if i've registered in eating does that mean that i'm completely tax compliant uh, perhaps maybe susan you can tell us um what is the difference uh, first of all so that for the clarity for clarity for the people who are asking questions in terms of where what what is the difference um so one is a software this is not tax compliance and so on and so forth but i would not give it the justice in terms of defining it i'd rather susan to to basically tell us where where the difference is uh yeah just to put that out of the way because it seems we're getting a lot of questions on sorry so Faustina, if i can seek some clarification where is the difference between uh e -teams? right mm -hmm. uh what is eTeams and does that mean i am tax compliant or is eTeams a tax actually the question was is eTeams no, no. a tax, is okay. a tax like tax bracket? okay so eTeams is simply an invoicing system eTeams does not amend or change any existing tax law it does not increase the tax rate it does not reduce it it doesn't alter it it doesn't change where you fall with regard to your obligations it doesn't change whether you are now VAT registered or not it is simply an invoicing system and the purpose of eTeams is to increase the commissioner's visibility of business transactions so that is the clarification that that eTeams is not um it is not an additional tax. It is simply a method that, you know, much like pay as you want. You know, pay as you want is deducted by your employer, remitted to KRA. And so it, it, it's, it's that sort of visibility that we want. It, it, it doesn't change the, the system, even, for example, um, increase a rate or no, it's simply an invoicing system. So that is, is I think, the clarification I can give that... Um, Yes, it doesn't alter your tax obligations. It simply increases that visibility. Thank you. So now that that is out of the way, then the question um, that remains is on how do I know my tax obligations as I register on eTeams? And secondly, how do I change? How do I, um, in the event that I am I, um, based on the business that I'm doing, I find myself having uh, an additional obligation, like um, you know, the transaction that I am about to do is butterball and so on and so forth. How do I how do I onboard that on eTeams? And this is actually a question that I want to pose to you, Martin, 
whereby um, entrepreneurs are saying, I'm not able to distinguish what I'm doing. Is this buttable or is it an buttable good? And in the event that um, at some point what I'm doing is going to be buttable, how do I proceed to basically register that um, with Kiari? Okay, thank you, Faustina. Fantastic question that needs clarification. So uh, just to build on what uh, my colleague Susan has said, ITIMS is simply for invoicing. <clears throat> and uh, when we talk about invoicing, uh, there is only one tax rate that goes to an invoice. It's usually either the transaction is vertable or it's not due for VAT. Okay, that's what goes on an invoice. So in the case where, for example, the nature of your supplies have changed from being non vertable and they have now become a vertable sale, or you're now you've, uh, upgraded and uh, now you're dealing with vertable supplies. We have deployed an enhancement uh, a few a few days ago, maybe this is the third day now, where as soon as the obligation is added to your PIN, the same is going to be uh, indicated on your uh, ETIMS platform, whatever platform you're using. So the only issue might come uh, in the case maybe where you're using ETIMS Lite, and uh, you've now reached the threshold for VAT or the nature of your supplies have changed, there we will have to transition you from ETIMS Lite to one of the ETIMS client solutions. So for that kind of a transition, you will need to visit any carry office and uh, they will assist you with that particular process. But if you're already on an existing ETIMS platform and you are a non-VAT taxpayer, as soon as the obligation is added onto your PIN, and the same is uh, added on ITAX, then uh, the switch from non-VAT to a VAT tax rate happens automatically. But in the case that that does not happen, you're still able to visit uh, a care office. And by the time you're leaving the office, in a few minutes, uh, officers in the authority will have uh, facilitated that particular change. Thank you, Faustina. Back to you. Thank you for that um, response. I hope that was sufficient enough for guys to be able to distinguish um, or you know, be able to distinguish what is buttable, what is non buttable And then in the event that you need to, there's an additional obligation, at least Martin was very explicit in, in terms of how to go about it. So um, I just want to now move to the questions that are um, some specific questions that are also that are still streaming in. And this one is related to those in the education sector. And they're talking about the fact that schools aren't taxed VAT. However, um, they're required to register the expenses with ETIMS. Um, so, for instance, Thomas, you can tell us um, how do we expense things like milk, groceries, you know, just the small, small things that you buy um, as a school. How do you expense that and ensure that there's compliance? Um, thank you, Faustina. I think that is why now the well, this is where ETIMS comes in, because ETIMS again is not about VAT. VTIMS, ETIMS is actually an invoicing system. It is a way of capturing your incomes and your expenses. Uh, so what the schools should do is one, ensure that whatever supplies they are purchasing, whatever uh, they are buying is actually coming from vendors who are able then to issue them with ETIMS invoices. That way they will be able to capture those expenses uh, within the systems. Um, they should be able to formalize that and just get uh, whoever supplies them to be able to actually issue them with ETIMS invoices uh, for all their purchases and their supplies. That way they will have captured that. And uh, doesn't matter whether these suppliers uh, have VAT on their products uh, or not, uh, they should be able to issue in ETIMS invoices uh, to them uh, to be able to actually then uh, capture the expenses in the system. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. I hope for the guys in the education sector, 
Um, now you know. <laughs> Register for your teams. <laughs> um, but to use, now a question to you, Suzanne, which is, seems to come in as a complaint due to um, lack of clear information. Where do companies that are limited by guarantee fall, for instance, nonprofits? Um, and um, how does all this legislation on taxation actually affect them? Okay, so I start with um, companies that are limited by guarantee. I don't believe that the limitation by guarantee actually affects a company's tax status. However, non-governmental um, uh, organizations and NGO. So, if you go to the Income Tax Act, the first schedule, paragraph ten, the first schedule lists all the income that can be derived from Kenya that is exempt from taxation. And paragraph 10, if you read it, will include the work of NGOs because paragraph 10 pertains to institutions or bodies of persons that are of a public character and are established solely for the purpose of relieving poverty or distress of the public or the advancement of religion or education. And those are exempt from income in as far as that um, income is used um, solely for the purposes that result for the benefit of Kenya. So NGOs um, income is exempt. All right. Okay. Okay. I think that's very clear. Um, so now to you, Martin. And um, this question has been shared um, since we launched the call for guys to join this particular webinar. So eatings has been down <laughs> for a while. Uh, it is not helping us remain compliant. Um, is there a plan to resolve it? Has it been resolved or? what should we do next because now it's not about us it is you please just repeat the first part of the question i didn't quite catch it the the quest the the conversation is the fact that um items has been down for a while it's been almost a week. Uh, yeah yeah Are there plans to rectify that because now it's not us not being compliant it's your system not working <laughs> uh let me begin by apologizing on behalf of the authority uh you know sometimes the thing with systems you know system downtime is a is a thing and uh this is one of those kind of scenarios where we're experiencing a bit of a downtime uh currently we are in the process of working on it i believe it should be re uh, restored anytime now actually and uh, we'll be able to proceed with our invoicing as uh, as normal. And again, I just want to apologize on behalf of the authority. We understand some of the inconveniences that have been caused, but uh, we are working to rectify that as soon as possible. And we will. Yeah. No, Martin, for us as entrepreneurs, as soon as possible can be next year. <laughs> I wish I wish we could get a date. At least that will give us some level of confidence, right? But at least um, let me say efforts are being made. We will we will stick with that. But for once, it's not us; it is you. Okay. But um, <laughs> while Kerry is fixing these issues, Thomas. Um, it's at least we can take advantage of that window and fix ourselves, um, fix our ability to become compliant. So my question to you, Thomas, is um, how how can um, entrepreneurs basically um, position themselves or uh, yeah position themselves so that as these changes on tax legislations are happening, they are basically able to adopt them as fast as possible is it by adopting you know technology some of us have very small businesses and so on and so forth so how do we ensure that we are always at the nick of understanding what you know these changes that are being brought out by KRA and that we remain fully compliant and i will use an example um pegged on an entrepreneur that i was with yesterday and they showed me an email from KRA telling them that they have not registered for eating but you see, they're busy. Okay, so that they don't want, but they're busy. So how, as an expert, how do you help them to ensure that 
at least when these changes are happening, they're able to adopt them as fast as possible. Thank you, Faustina. Um, one of the things I always encourage every uh, business person, every individual, is to keep abreast with what is happening. Uh, though being cognizant again of the fact that uh, there's a lot that uh, happens in the tax arena and you may not be able to um, just understand everything and uh, be able to track all those changes. However, there are things that you can do as a business person and one I usually say is find uh, somebody who can keep abreast with these matters and can assist you from a business perspective. Uh, be able then to have your business uh, abreast and remaining compliant. Uh, the second thing is uh, build processes in your business as simple as they may be to first of all just help you have order around your business transactions. Uh, have order around that. And uh, it does not, order does not come necessarily from big and expensive uh, accounting systems and ERPs. Order can be found in a spreadsheet. Order can be found in a notebook. Depending on the size of your business, you can actually bring order to the transactions uh, that you run. And um, there are people who can assist you, like we can assist you, uh, be able to actually bring order to those transactions. Now, when your business transactions are orderly, it does not matter uh, what legislation or changes in legislations that happen with taxation. You will be very easily able to adapt uh, with this. And I'll give an example, even just for like items. For businesses that have actually had uh, order in their transaction processing, they have been keeping, uh, recording their transactions, they have been keeping good records of their inventory and everything. When the ETIMS requirement came in, all they did is registered and plugged in that into an existing system and it works and it moves on. So it is important that first of all, we sort out the business side of things, which is having order in our transactions. And then it is very easy now to plug in to all these other things. But thirdly, also get some tax advice, some sound tax advice, which does not have to be expensive. It is advice that first of all, will get you to understand what are your tax obligations as a business? What obligations do you have from a tax perspective? Now, if you understand that, then it is very easy as you go about your everyday uh, business to know what is falling due or what you're incurring and what you're doing, then have that assistance in helping you prepare and put together your returns on a periodic basis. Now you can outsource that, you can have somebody who comes in and does it for you, but also you can learn how to do it for simpler businesses and where uh, your transactions may not be too many and you also are trying to keep your costs down. Have somebody walk you through and teach you how to do it and then you can go ahead and you can do it. And then every so often you can get help to just check and confirm that you're keeping on the right track. Now, if you put in steps like that, you will always uh, be on the compliant side of taxes. Back to you, Faustina. You mentioned a very <laughs> funny thing, the word compliant. And I remember um, the first time I got into the space of access to finance, every investor would remind me that, tell the entrepreneur, having a tax compliance certificate does not mean you are compliant. <laughs> and therefore, um, for those of us listening in, seek professional help, as Thomas has mentioned, and um, he has not paid me to say this, but I have benefited from his lessons. I have benefited from just listening to him and helping us remain, um, you know, right with things. But now this is basically my segue to now to go back to Susan and ask her, um, those of us who, let's just say, we have not been compliant and um, we have a couple of areas, yet for us to be able to access certain services, we need to present um, an up-to-date tax compliance certificate. Can I pay in installments without having, um, can I pay in installments and if I can, Am I going to pay a penalty or is, is there going to, is the, the installment going to attract uh, an extra fee or interest? I think I can take that question. Um, there's someone who's inquiring about whether they can um, pay in like um, arrears in installments. 
So yes, you can pay your arrears in installments, but I do want to clarify for the group that um, the waiver, um, the waiver ability to provide a waiver, the waiver provisions have actually will end in June. 2023. So the waiver provisions, um, the, the, you know, we have, we currently have an amnesty. So any taxes that you had not paid prior to December 2022, you can get an amnesty. But this, the, the waiver provisions have been done away with. So what happens is that if you have any um, tax that has remained unpaid while you can get an installment, remember that the interest and the penalty is now becomes a valid and collectible debt. There are no more waiver provisions. So you can approach your tax service office and they can actually um, give you an, an installment plan. But um, just to remember that after June 2023, you will not be able to benefit from the amnesty and the waiver provisions have been done away with. So that is something that is, is worth it to remember. Oh, all right. <laughs> Pardon? Okay, that clear. Okay. Yeah, that is that is very clear. Unless um unless the somebody else who still does not will need more further clarification. I think Susan can actually share her contacts. Um, we will display that towards the end of this particular webinar. So um guys, please keep streaming in your questions. Some of them will be answered directly because they're very specific to an industry. Um, some are, they just keep flowing in um, multiple people from the same in industry, for instance, those in the education sector and the consulting sector. So since we have the key people from the Kenya Revenue Authority here, please feel free to ask as many questions as possible. So we have done at least an hour and a half of having this conversation where the KRE team has taken us through the entire ETIMS process. Who is legible? What do you need to do to start? How do you do it through e-citizen? Or if you do it through, if you register, if you onboard yourself through the ETIMS platform. So as we get towards the tail end of this particular webinar, um, I'm going to just ask a couple of other questions that had initially been brought forward in our first segment. And this question, um, I'm posing it to either you, Martin, or Susan. And this is about the email address that I used to register, um, that I used to register on ATIMS. If I use, say, my Gmail address, how can I change it to my business address in the event that I only want my, my you know, everything related to this tax obligation to be forwarded to my business, uh, my business address. So how do I make those changes? Um, and is it a long, tedious application process? And either Martin or Susan can proceed to answer. I, I can take that one. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to uh, changing the details, the first uh, port of call is our ITAX profile. So you amend the uh, email address, for example, or the mobile number, whatever information it is that you want to change, you do make that change on ITAX first. After that happens, as I've said, we have done an enhancement where the system is able to pick that automatically. And uh, it's just a process that takes a few minutes. But uh, if that change doesn't happen, you simply visit any care office and by the time you're leaving the care office whatever information you want to be reflecting will be reflected so it's not a tedious process it's very simple we've tried to automate the process but sometimes we understand that maybe the automation may not work as we envisage so there's a redundancy where you're able to walk into any care office for such kind of assistance and um, assuming, you know, some of us, we are running shops, and if you tell me to walk into a carry office, what you're saying is that I have to close my business and come to you. That is a day's worth of income that I might be losing in doing so. But you also mentioned that you have E-Teams champions all over the country. Are they, um, are they, can they come to my business instead of me having to come to you? Uh, that usually is left to the discretion of the tax station where they're operating from, but uh, nothing nothing prevents them from being able to do that. We are able to visit taxpayer premises, 
but again, and to insist, it's usually left to the discretion of the different tax stations. How do you know which tax stations or we just send a general inquiry and the right tax station will take up the issue? No, usually for you to know your tax station, it's usually listed on your PIN. Uh, I, I'll give an example. So if you have a PIN in, uh, in Nairobi, your physical address is anywhere in Nairobi, you'll either be mapped to north of Nairobi, west of Nairobi, or east and south of Nairobi. So that is either going to be Times Towers, the Upper Hill office, or uh, Samia office. But uh, usually that's listed on the pin where your tax station is. And uh, you can simply just make a visit to your tax station. I'm sure sometimes even numbers are provided for. On, uh, the, you can get them via the net. So there's a number of ways you can reach us, actually. Or you simply call customer care. They can connect you to whatever tax station uh, you belong to. I can also reach out to you, I guess. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you so much. So we have dealt on a lot of inquiries related to ETIMS. And um, I, I, we are doing all this for the sake of being able to run good businesses. And running good businesses means also being able to earn a living, make a profit, um, pay salaries, and so on and so forth. So um, my question is to you, Thomas, in terms of um, with all these things that are happening, and like I said, we are about to hear the budget and new obligations coming our way. How are we going to remain profitable knowing that we are just coming from a series of new taxes, housing, levy, what not, and so on and so forth? How are we going to survive this, Thomas? Mm -hmm. Christina, from a, a business perspective, I think the first key thing we need to is uh, be prepare ourselves to first of all understand what changes may be coming with the new finance bill, um, so that whatever changes come with it, then one we are able to adapt uh, to it. I think um, what we'll do is after adapting, we must work on just uh, growing and solidifying our businesses. Uh, so that then uh, we are able to grow them, enlarge them, expand them, generate more revenue, and therefore uh, have enough uh, to be able to actually meet all these uh, costs that come in, including uh, the taxes that need to be paid uh, there. But uh, one of the things I like separating is uh, when you look at taxes and you look at uh, the income and the revenues, generally tax is either collected on behalf, like VAT, is, uh, is not a cost to the business that is registered. It's tax that is just being collected on behalf of government um, and remitted all uh, the same. When you look at uh, pay as you earn, these are deductions that are actually being done on employees, basically employee emoluments, uh, gross pays that have been agreed on and what the company has committed to pay this. However, I know that when it comes to certain other deductions, uh, there's an employer contribution element uh, to it, which then the businesses need to be able to absorb and uh, to take in uh, and to do that. But when you look at um, taxes in general, uh, they are an offshoot of what we do. Uh, the higher the profit you make from an income tax perspective, then the higher the tax that you'll be paying. When you make lower profit, then the tax that you pay is lower. When you make a loss for the business, then again, there is no tax the company pays from an income tax uh, standpoint, uh, that is. So it's important then uh, for us to figure out as entrepreneurs, how do we adapt best? And I think it's just taking strategies now on how do we make our businesses resilient to the environment? How can we then grow and enlarge our base uh, of business so that we have bigger and more resilient companies? And also then how do we innovate to then uh, spend less uh, and do more? How do we then have cost savings uh, that can come from the things we do? How can we be more efficient uh, in the things we do? I think um, these new changes coming in and changes that keep happening year on year, for business people calls for a lot of introspection and uh, a lot of then um, 
innovation uh, in how them to get our businesses to grow in the environment. Because one thing I always say is remember these taxes are increasing across board for everyone. Uh, it's not for just specific uh, businesses, it's not for my business and not the other businesses. It's across board, uh, depending on the tax and the sector that we are in. So we need to start figuring out how we can get our businesses to be resilient enough to actually withstand these times and not only just withstand them, but to then grow and thrive in these uh, times. Um, you have you have spoken um, yeah, like a true consultant that you are. But you see, the thing is, um, when we look at uh, taxes and every time there's a new tax obligation, you know, something new that has been added to your obligations as an entrepreneur, it always feels like you're taking away my money. And from what some of you have just said is that it's ideally not yours. It is the government doing what they need to do. Uh, yeah, so it's not easy. Let's just say it's not easy. You know, yesterday on Twitter, they were talking about rejecting your finance bill. And I was looking at the conversations and people were saying, let me wake up in the morning to go and work for the government. From what you have said, Thomas, is that you're not doing it. You're working for yourself. But for you to be able to work for yourself, a small portion of what you what you do goes to the government for the sake of um, let me use their slogan to lipo ushuru to jitegeme. <laughs> but Susan, my question to you is the fact that um, from that particular statement, uh, me, which refers to the fact that we have to pay these taxes, um, and that a lot of information keeps coming out, and I know you have shared your contacts. Um, is there an alternative in terms of um, trying to simplify information on these tax, law, tax laws, assuming they're unable to even afford Thomas's services? Um, are there any other alternatives that we can even share with shopkeepers? I've seen there's a gentleman who's keeping livestock here and is like, is there a way you can simplify all this information for the sake of entrepreneurs? Okay, um, thank you for Sina. That's a, an actually a, a very good question. And I think um, one that we are attempting as KRA, not just to simplify the information, but even to simplify the returns. Um, I know today's training was particularly about e-teams, but just to speak about simplifying information, um, if you are a small trader, and um, you are engaged in a business and the business is not subject, for example, to withholding tax, doesn't pertain to rental income, um, then you know you can, uh, for example, instead of, of filing under the annual system, you can file under turnover tax, which is a very simplified system. You simply declare you are, you are turnover and you pay 1.5% of the sales. So we do have trainings. I know we have trainings every week um, for newly registered taxpayers. You can still attend it even if you've been registered um, previously. And that information is actually given, um, you know, it is structured for a newly registered ta taxpayer. So it is not an overload of information. It simply allows you to um, to begin to, to gain compliance even from the point of registration. I will share our email address in the chat so that you can share your email. We can invite you. The trainings are for all tax heads. There's VAT, there's income tax return filing, pay as you want, turnover tax, excise duty. So we that has been done. Um, and we do actually conduct trainings weekly for that purpose. And I will share the contact details so that anybody can just let us know and in the email when you you write to that email please write which particular training you want to be invited to if you're not sure you can just leave it blank you can attend and see okay this is relevant to me this one is not thank you for that um susan and you can also attend this kind of webinar so as i mentioned earlier we'll be having a series of webinars in terms of doing good businesses doing good business and we'll be having carry on call so that they can help us demystify or address some of the challenges that that you have so they are we're basically saying there'll be multiple options where you can be able to access information so that you focus on running 
your business. Um, so uh, I have a particular question that is directed to you, Martin, and maybe of course Susan, because you work in the same from you work at the same company, you can also answer if you have a response. But the question is um, the fact that um, the ETIM system looks very complicated, complicated, um, and I do not want to move my stock management system to KRA since I already have my own, and I think um, you have partly. Um, responded to this um, in terms of it's just integration and uh, Thomas has also alluded to the same but this client is specifically not he's just not for having a carry system to help me manage my stock and secondly still from the same same person is the fact that they are concerned about the commitment form that has a clause you know nowadays we are reading the terms and conditions that small fine print we are reading them and um it's and that clause actually says that i will not proceed with formatting or resetting the device in which the e-teams is installed until i get written authorization from kra upon an officially submitted request what does this mean okay i'll begin with the first question about uh, them not wanting to uh, move uh, or to leave their stock, whatever system it is that they're using for hours. It's allowed, uh, and as we stated, one of the options that is available to taxpayers is that they're able to keep their systems, but integrate with carry to make that system compliant. So I'm sure they've customized their system as, as they'd wish to. You know, the system does everything that they want it to do. So in such a case, maybe it might be unfair for us to tell you to leave that system to come to ours. So what we will advise is then that you consider exploring the system to system option so that you can keep uh, using your system. And uh, just uh, putting it out there that um, our system isn't very hard to use. Uh, as with any new system, you know, you have to learn it. But uh, after you use it once, twice, the third time, then, you know, you become conversant with how the system works. Uh, when we go to the other question uh, about the commitment form, there is uh, something that we need to understand a bit in depth, and this is colloquially speaking, that the machine onto which items is onboarded uh, ceases to just be a laptop, okay? It becomes an electronic tax register. And it is through that system that you will be generating invoices. And once the invoices are generated, uh, the invoices save. You know, the device or the gadget you'll be using will have a copy of those invoices. So if you are to simply format uh, that device without informing us, will be losing. Uh, they will be lost a lot of vital information pertaining to your transactions ever since you onboarded. And as we stated uh, before, that there's a provision in the TPA or there's a requirement in the TPA that we should be able to keep a copy of all our transactions for at least five years. So the primary source of these transactions, though you might print them and have them in a file, the primary source of these transactions will be that ETR, uh, or in the case, or in this case, a laptop. So, just to prevent uh, such kind of losses, to prevent such kind of issues arising, we do understand that sometimes these gadgets may develop a problem that require for them to be formatted. For example, it is why that requirement is there that you will inform uh, CARE, or in this case, the commissioner directly through a written uh, application that you intend to format the machine. 
we make sure that particularly if you're registered for VAT, that these transactions that were generated using the device have been accounted for all in the returns, after which you can then proceed to generate your invoices. So it's just a matter of protecting the integrity of the transactions that you have, protecting that data, and complying with that requirement in the TPA of us being able to keep uh, a record of all our transactions. So that's the reason why that is explicit in the commitment form. Back to you, Faustina. Wow. So I hope that is a sufficient response on the same in terms of why um, you cannot proceed to format or make changes without carry, um, without basically carry approval. So I guess from what Martin has said then is that in the event that this needs to happen, you need to adopt, like you need to adopt some technological changes, um, just take time to visit with carry so that you also don't it doesn't become another pain point for you as a business owner. Um, so we've actually come to the end of this um, webinar and I'm loving the questions that are coming in. I know most of them are very specific to your current needs as entrepreneurs and um, we will endeavor to respond to each and every um, each and every question. So no matter how small you might think your issue is, please, Feel free to raise it on the the the, the Q and A, um, the Q and A option on your screen, um, and then Martin and Susan or Thomas will actually respond to it so that we are compliant. We are business people. We are not um, we are not the ones paying the taxes. We are doing business so that they can come and collect and collect the taxes. So as we come to the end of this um, webinar. Um, it was very technical this time round, but we appreciate it. Today's conversations was all about um, ETIMS, um, but I'd still like the panelists to basically tell us what is their call to action given all that we have discussed, given the questions that are coming in. I know last uh, the last two weeks the conversation was on records, 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 and Susan kept insisting, keep the right records. Kiara is open to listen to you negotiate with you just don't come and do don't come and present create you know creative accounting books that do not make sense they also have touch points where they can um verify what you have to offer so this time around i know um you know the the, the issues of working with teams have been so prevalent they've become a buzz right now for the last two weeks but maybe the panelists can tell us what is their final word of advice to us as entrepreneurs moving forward so that we focus on doing good business. And I will start with home, which is Thomas, as usual, a fellow expert here at the Sandbox. So Thomas, what is your word of advice to the entrepreneurs listening in? Uh, my word of advice this week is uh, do not be caught not knowing. Uh, please uh, get to understand what your obligations are and what you need to do to comply and to be in the right space as far as your business and your taxes are concerned. Uh, my philosophy is that there's always help in all different forms and shapes. Um, there's always, I would say, a consultant at a level for every business. Please find help. It could be in the form of a webinar like this that you could attend and it just all it costs you is taking your time uh, to attend and listen, or you could actually then contract somebody who is an expert in the area mm -hmm. to come in and just help you. But don't be caught uh, flat-footed, don't be caught unprepared, don't be caught ignorant, uh, learn, understand, and get compliant. Uh, let your business be compliant, because this information is available. It's just where you look for it and who you speak to and it will benefit not only just you, but your business in a tremendous way. Thank you, Faustina. Thank you for that. A reminder from Thomas that ignorance is not an excuse in the courts of law. <laughs> thank you, thank you for that, uh, Thomas. To you, Susan, what is your word of advice to the entrepreneurs listening in? We are actually more than 100 entrepreneurs listening in. Okay. Um, my word of advice actually directly relates to the question that was asked regarding NGOs. Um, 
if you are an, a, a, an institution that is undertaking any of those activities that I mentioned in paragraph 10 of the first schedule, and the, you, you know, uh, obtain a tax exemption. You can obtain a tax exemption. You can apply to the commissioner through ITAX. You will be required to provide certain documentation, the application letter, the registration certificate. You'll be asked for documentation, the PIN numbers of the um, of the officials and your audited accounts. But you can apply for an exemption certificate um, so that you are able to 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 have your income tax exempt. So just an, a, a word of advice for you if if you actually are engaging in that space. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And then lastly, to the man of the hour. Eh? He's not a myth. He is the man of the hour. Our e-teams expert, Martin. Today was your day to shine. <laughs> we were your support staff for the day. What is your final word of advice? And I hope you're going to end with a contact so that we can reach you. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Faustina. Let me just begin by saying um, thank you for today's invite. We always enjoy uh, when you're able to come speak to taxpayers, talk to the issues, you know, and try to help them understand what it is that they're required to do. It's a thing that we enjoy to also try and change that uh, perception that is uh, out there about care. We are your brothers, we are, you know, just one of you, and uh, we want to see your businesses growing. So for me, my final word, I'll just speak to items again. Kindly uh, let us try to be as compliant as we possibly can uh, with the provisions of the law. Uh, I think we have all seen the proposal that is in Parliament about and the penalties for not using the for generating our indices. So let us not find ourselves in a situation where we are running afoul of the authority and afoul of the law when it comes to matters items. I want to assure everybody our solutions are pretty easy to use. They are easy to learn, and uh, we are there to assist in any way that you might need us to do and we'll continue to do so. So I, I was going to leave my uh, contact as a mystery, but uh, for those ones who want to reach me, you can reach me on my extension. It's uh, 07 09 017711. So 07 09 017711. That is my direct extension. And uh, if I may not answer, probably sometimes I'm either in a meeting or I'm assisting another taxpayer somewhere. So don't despair. But I always endeavor to return the calls. So back to you, Faustina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that generosity of sharing your contact. And like you said, in case he doesn't answer, he's helping a fellow entrepreneur in their issues. So thank you guys um, for such a lovely conversation technical i must say because we were talking about one government device that is a headache to many of us entrepreneurs but it is worthy when we have such kinds of conversations because at the end of the day we don't want to become another statistical victim of um, non-compliance tax evasion what not just simply because of um, a system a software just a software that has been um, brought about by the government. So um, you guys have been a fantastic co-host, those of us who are listening in, because thanks to you, we were able to ask questions to Thomas, Susan, and, um, and Martin. So you're all fantastic co-hosts. Wherever you are, please clap for yourselves. Um, given the, the, the system that you're using for this particular webinar, I can see some people wanted to, to ask questions direct and they raise their hands unfortunately we are unable to facilitate that at the moment but as we continue to have this series of conversations um, with experts that will enable us to run good businesses um, at some point of course we will open this up so please um, gear up for more of these kinds of um, things 
um, gear up also for one of the bigger, you know, the bigger events as a culmination for all these activities that we're running, which is the big Baraza, and where we'll have more and more experts coming in to help you through, through, you know, the challenges, the gap areas, you know, that you're or the pain point areas that you're facing as an organization. So thank you so much for joining us for those two hours. I know it's not easy also as an entrepreneur carving out two hours from your business. But you had faith, you know what this is uh, um, This is going to do for your business. So thank you so much for tuning in for those two hours. Our panelists, you guys are always a fantastic team, very technical, you know your staff. So you can be rest assured, we'll be calling you again and again in person, online, wherever. We will find ways to call you so that you can help us as entrepreneurs succeed. So with that, um, from me, your moderator, my name is Faustina, for those who are joining later on. Uh, my name is Faustina, I work for Wild International, where we are strategy experts who, you know, help entrepreneurs succeed in what they have to do. We are your key to your next success story as an entrepreneur. So with that, I'd like to hand this over to the Sandbox team that organized this and will continue to organize more and more of this so that they can officially end this particular webinar and also communicate um, in terms of uh, when is the next activity is it in person is it a webinar is it are we all going to storm carry offices so yeah so back to you wendy or emily um thank you so much for Stina. first of all i have learned so much i am very I'm feeling very empowered as a taxpayer and a few things here and there that I have picked up on. But thank you so much for Stina, um, Susan, Thomas, and sorry. Sorry. And Martin. Um, really do appreciate. So I've seen a lot of questions in the chat and there's are questions that have not been answered. We shall share a document with that will have all the answered questions. Um from this webinar, how you can reach the KRE team for the, the extension line that Martin has shared as well. We will share that as well. Keep your eye out for the next webinar session. We will send it to your emails for every, all the 96 of you who attended this webinar. We'll send it to you. Thank you so much and we look forward to seeing you at the next one.